On July 19th, 2008, the final episode of Avatar The Last Airbender aired on Nickelodeon. The four-part magnum opus to the series, Sozin's Comet, was aired to widespread applause and massive positive feedback across the board from the people who made it. It was, however, the end of the era for the series, as the three-year-long story of Avatar Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Zuko all came to an end with the fall of Fire Lord Ozai and the end of the Fire Nation's war against not only the Avatar, but the world as they knew it. With major success, however, came a lot of questions on if a sequel series or a continuation would be done following the ending of this, as the creators of ATLA, Michael DiMartino and Brian Conatisco, made no indications in the following years that a continuation would be on the table. That was, however, until Nickelodeon came knocking on the doors and practically demanding them to create a new show in the Avatar universe. And when the network that practically hosted your show is telling you to get on a sequel like that, it's kind of hard to say no. So in 2010, news broke out that Avatar would be getting a sequel, then being used as a miniseries titled Avatar Legend of Korra. This later expanded into a full-blown 12-episode series which then later expanded into four seasons branching out close to 52 episodes, essentially becoming its own entity in the Avatar canon. And from 2012 to 2014, these episodes would air, and while the consensus of the series was a bit contentious back then, let's just say the public discussion of Korra is less than favorable these days. However, it's been over a decade since its original air date and times have changed, so I think now it's a good time as any to go ahead and reevaluate The Legend of Korra. Now, let's get a few things that I'm obviously not going to be able to defend out of the way, and there's about five main points that point to a lot of things that I'm really not going to be able to say, hey, this is actually kind of alright, because, uh, no. No, it wasn't for these five. Number one, the Beifong family being cops. This one's probably the most egregious one, and while I will get into the treatment of the legacy characters from ATLA much later on in this video, this one really does need to be brought up initially because this one is honestly the one that nobody has ever been able to defend correctly, and I certainly will not be doing it here today. This one is arguably the biggest betrayal of Toph's entire character from her original point in ATLA, and basically undoes literally her entire character arc from the original series to the point where she went from being part of the monarchy in the Earth Kingdom to literally being the peacekeepers of it. Like, I'm sorry, but you literally had an entire arc revolving around this for Toph, just for her to go back on it and- Look, look. Toph and the entire Bayfog family coming after her being cops is one of the worst decisions that they probably made for this, and it's the biggest betrayal of any of the legacy characters out of all of them. Trust me, there's a few things we're gonna get into later on with the legacy ones, but uh, this one was the biggest one for me that I could not defend under any circumstances. Number two, the anticlimax of Amon's death. I'm gonna get into more about Amon when we actually get to the villains of this, because as a, as a character, Amon is really good. Like, top shelf tier, if you ask me. I just feel like his ending really could have done so much better with what's going on with this, especially the way that he was basically just shipped out to sea and it's basically poof, right there. We never see from Amon again and he's never really mentioned all that much after this, leading me to believe that he's literally what remains of the first part of it only being 12 episodes long and they weren't expecting anything after this. And I get why, but also... You really have to wonder, if they knew they were going to be making more after this, would they have done more with Amon or not have him be killed off? Either way, I feel like it's one of the biggest missteps and I'm not going to be able to defend it in this one. Number three, the awkward Korra Mako Asami love triangle. Oh god, okay, so you know how everyone was just so up in arms about who was winding up with who at ATLA? This was probably worse than that at its peak, and to be honest, it's literally the worst kind of love triangle. It's one of those ones where it's just like, there's tension, they love each other, then they hate each other, then there's tension between the other two, and it's just... It's not good storytelling, it's really not good character building, and it's not good relationship building either. 
Not only that, but every single combination of Kuro being with Mako and Mako being with Asami is so bad. I mean, genuinely, they are, none of them are fit to be with Mako because the chemistry is not there. Like, if there was negative levels of chemistry, you would find it in all of these relationships going on right now. And we're going to get into the other part of that love triangle later on. Trust me, we're going to talk about that. But when it comes to the whole dynamic in the first two seasons, and maybe maybe two and a half if there's if you count the little bits that happened in season three I guess but between all of that dynamic in the first two and a half bits of the series it's not great in fact I would be surprised that this is one of the big reasons why so many people don't like Korra because I get why with this number four book two just being really bad look I've heard so many people critique book two of Korra to the point where they have actively said when watching it that they have had to go on breaks for several months and I know one particular person who is probably going to be listening to this who has not picked up Legend of Korra back up and still has two more seasons to go through and Jazzy get to the better parts already I swear it gets good but to be honest I get why so many people drop Korra after the second book because uh yeah, there's a lot of really bad bits in here. I'm gonna try and defend some of them later on, mainly on a conceptual level, but I get why a lot of people really do not like this, to be honest, and why they kind of drop off after book two. And to be honest, I kind of get it. I get why, but also... I'm kind of hoping that you see why these bits can be salvaged, but not all of it can. Like, the Dark Avatar stuff is probably one of the worst things to ever happen in the show. Like, no joke. A Dark Avatar. Like, not even an original name, mind you. Just Dark Avatar. It's like, it's like deviant art levels of bad, to be honest. And it's just... Oh god, oh god, just book two is like the low point of the entire thing, like everyone is just the worst in it. The Koromako Asami love triangle that we mentioned previously is worse, it's at its peak of badness in this. And not only that, but everyone is just, I don't want to say they're being out of character in this, but my god, my god, are the relationship dynamics so messed up in this, it's beyond a joke. But yeah, I get why book two is bad. There's a lot of individual aspects we're going to try and defend, but I get why people say that they drop off after this. I'm not going to defend book two in its entirety. I'm going to defend some smaller bits that happen in it, and that's that. And finally, number five, Asami forgiving her father. This one is a bit more of a personal one, so I get why some people are going to be a bit surprised why I'm not going to be able to defend this, but I feel like Asami defending and later forgiving her father in book four after everything that's happened in the series up until that point... That one really just does not work, to be honest. Like, I get that there's a three-year time skip by that period of time, and they probably had a lot of time to try and work through the issues, and maybe he's potentially tried to reform himself. But, but no, he doesn't deserve it. Shitty parents do not deserve redemption, damn it. Especially in this circumstance, where, where... Literally, at the point where she actually tr where she actually says she forgives him, it's before he does anything heroic and does anything to better himself as a person in her eyes. She just forgives him because, I don't know, empathy, I guess? But you need more than empathy in order to actually get to that point. It's just... I'm sorry, but this is one of the worst decisions in terms of, of Asali's character, to be honest. She should not have forgiven her father that easily. Like... Have it happened potentially, like, after the sacrifice, maybe? Like, maybe when he's actually shown some good at that point, where he's willing to defend it, where he's willing to put himself in that line of fire in order to do it, and have it happen after the fact? But doing it when he's done nothing to deserve it, and doing it when it's such a pathetic sight as well, that is not something I'm going to be able to defend, and actively something that I'm saying, it's actually a negative for Korra, in my opinion. But, uh, with all that out of the way, let's roll up our sleeves, and let's get into the parts of why we're here. Let's get into reevaluating the Legend of Korra, starting with... First off, let's talk about the gal herself, 
Korra. Already quite the contentious figure in her own series as a hero, given that, compared to her predecessor Aang, there was a lot to live up to, not just from a character standpoint, but arguably from being the Avatar both in story and out of it. I mean, when your first showcase of this character is her as a kid, literally already having mastered several abilities of water, earth, and fire already, it's no wonder the public were quick to dub her a Mary Sue, as it were, when the series debuted. Not only that, but the initial change from the calm monk child that was Avatar Aang in the original series to brash, cocky teenager Korra might have rubbed people in the wrong way, but in my opinion, it's part of the major theme of TLOK change. In fact, change is such a topic of discussion in this series that they literally named one of the arcs in the series after it. And honestly, having such a brashly contrasted main character like Korra starting us off like this? I think it's a good move, honestly. Others are free to disagree with the idea that she is unrealistic of a character in the first season and that she should be acting the way she is as Avatar, but honestly it works to the story's favor when you look at the bigger picture. Aang was a complex character in his series because he was a kid taken out of his own time, raised to be believed that he would be the next in line of the Avatar lineage, and therefore never got a real childhood as a result of it. In a way, some could argue he's unrealistic of a character in those ways because he was way too mature for his own good, even for someone raised by air temple monks. Korra, on the other hand, got to experience that kind of childhood, and when she's discovered as a prodigy of bending, of course it would make sense for her to be this cocky at the beginning, which makes it all the more satisfying when she's constantly brought back down to Earth when she's learning and bending with Tenzin in, in Book 1. Her attitude with those around her, namely the trio she ends up befriending in Bolin, Mako, and Asami, initially is a bit tepid and untrustworthy given that she's in a world now that expects everything from her as being the new Avatar, and in several points in the series make it clear that while she may have gotten by on that ideal with ease previously, she can't curse by on her avatar status forever. Especially given how at nearly every turn of this series, she has to confront the fact that not everyone is happy with their being an avatar still after years of peace, or even the idea that bending is even a societal structure still, or that history has been so unkind to certain nations because of the avatar's previous influence. You get the point by now. Unlike her predecessors, there's been more to her story than just being able to be a successor to Aang, and eventually that mounting pressure to try and be the hero that everyone expects her to be, while at the same time continuing to maintain herself as a growing teenager, comes crumbling down not once, not twice, but three times in this series. And to be blunt about it, what's might have been enough at the beginning to establish that yes, the role of the Avatar has a lot of pressure behind it, but the effects of being poisoned by Zaheer and losing it when it counted against Kuvira were both crushing blows to Korra's psyche, both of which tie into each other in a harsh way. To the point where Korra essentially spends the last season battling post-traumatic stress disorder after literally being poisoned by liquid metal in her body, which not only caused her to lose her bending for a second time in the show, but left her paralyzed for a good year or so. And even when the majority of it was taken out, it took her having to basically go through makeshift therapy with several people, including Toph and the person who put the poison in her to begin with, to fully restore her to her properly powered state. But even then, Korra as a character was never the same following on from those events. By the end of the series, she's far and away from the brash, arrogant teenager who came to Republic City without permission, got arrested on her first day, and picked fights with reckless abandon. By the end of Book 4, it could be argued that she's matured not just literally due to the three year time skip, but also mentally, given she's gone through three separate events that have effectively left her with trauma she may never fully recover from. It's no wonder, even when given every opportunity to and reason to end Kuvira, she not only spares her initially, but saves her twice and chooses to leave Republic City by the end instead of to stick around and be its protector. She's done her time, and instead of being another egg, she's carving out her own path instead. And that in of itself is a great character arc. Sometimes your main character isn't always going to be someone who is hypervigilant or is a rightful moral compass all the time. Sometimes your main character is just someone who's human enough to realize their limits, recognize their own needs at the end of it all, and be someone who you could see in them. You wouldn't want to, mind you. But how Korra handles everything in the series is one of the hardest one, two, three punch dynamics in, in the course of four seasons, and essentially has one of the most traumatic character arcs for a main protagonist in all of modern animation. 
cartoons or otherwise. It's a miracle that she's able to pull herself together by the end is what I'm saying. But to put it in another way, Korra is the literal manifestation of the gifted kid to burned out adult pipeline in the Avatar universe, was pretty much able to bend almost all the elements when she was like seven or eight and is then thrusted into the world's new savior so quickly she didn't have time to truly grow up. But for what it's worth, Korra's character arc is designed for the initial reaction of oh she's too cocky to be the Avatar to turn into holy shit this kid was not ready to deal with a world so cruel to her for being the Avatar in four seasons. And it's one of the big reasons why this works so well. The other reason being... Aman, Unalak, Sahir, and Kuvira are individually some of the most complex antagonists and villains in any of the stories told by Team Avatar, and I feel like they get a bad rep, although some don't really have much room for debate given the story they're in isn't as great. But let's run down the main theme amongst all of them. The end of the Avatar, in one way or another. And starting with the first one, Amon, who spends the entirety of the first book of TLOK running the Equalist Movement, a very heavy-handed attempt at some form of ill-minded socialism, believing that bending as a whole should be taken away from not just those in power, but the world itself in order to obtain true peace. Mind you, I feel like Amon more or less didn't think about the idea that if you remove bending from the equation, the very world around them would more or less cease, but let's not get too nitpicky about this. The fact that you assume it's just a cheap parlor trick of removing people's bending from them to get people on his side works so effectively, it's almost insanely good with how the plot twist is that he's both a bloodbender and is actually able to remove people's bending from them to the point where he removes it from Lin Bay Fog and Korra by the arc's end. Plus his backstory of being a prodigy waterbender who's also the son of a previously known crime boss in Republic City in Yukon, someone who even Avatar Aang in his older years couldn't beat when tried for his crimes, and becoming an even worse threat than his own father was, is really something to look at in regards to the cyclical nature of revenge, something that may come up more than once in this for what it's worth. The only downside is, like I said before, his ending. He doesn't get tried for his crimes, he gets away with his brother Tarlock, and he kills both of them at see. It's the only villain ending in the series that feels so anticlimactic in my opinion, because I feel like a mom could have done so much more. But given that they assumed it was only a one season affair initially when making this, I can kind of understand it, but not really defend it. Something I can defend, however, is Unalak as the villain in Book 2, being one of the only highlights of spirits in my honest opinion. I mean, at the start of Book 2, he's introduced as someone who could basically be a better mentor than Tenzin is at this point for Korra. Everyone is throwing up signs that he's a red flag in human form, but Korra is too focused on wanting to learn more, which, as we establish as part of her story arc of wanting to know more equals being a better avatar. And Unalak takes advantage of that as well by manipulating Korra into opening up the gate to the spirit realm, under the guise of using the age-old The Avatar is the link between worlds mantra to his advantage. With his goal essentially to have there not be a link between worlds and just have the spirit world and the human world be one. Mind you, he's also doing this to release the opposing power of the Avatar and Vatu from its eternal prison in the spirit world and uh, usher in a new era of darkness with his inside of him as a result, but to be honest here, Unalak may be one of the only villains in the Avatar Mythos who in some way wins here. And spoiler alert, he's not going to be the only one from TLOK to do so. But for what he does in Book 2, it's not hard to see why he may be one of the only saving graces of that entire season to both myself and many others. That is, until we get to the Dark Avatar stuff, but honestly, even then, he still manages to maintain himself as a very interesting villain, manipulating and using Korra, even to the bitter end. And even in that end, he's managed to get what he wanted and ensure that his goals of bringing the spirit realm and human world together not only works, but manages to leave an impact on the rest of the series to come. This is then seen with the next villain to come after, Zaheer. Sahir is basically the most intimidating villain in the series, not on a mental or political level, but the physical level. He's honestly the closest comparison one could make to Ozai from ATLA in terms of physical overpowering, but that's where the comparisons between the two end. Because Sahir's motives are driven by pure anarchy, as seen by him destroying the monarchy in the Earth Kingdom, an event which will also have rippling effects in the remainder of the series, and especially in one character in particular. 
His attacks on public figures and the Red Lotus's plan to enact the downfall, physical or otherwise, of all the nation's leaders so that there is no ruling class and the spirits can live amongst them freely, while flawed in certain aspects, does make sense in the long term. Because instead of wanting to brazenly end the Avatar like those before him, he wants to do such a degree that we haven't seen from the others as his reasoning had nothing to do with power for power's sake, or even the destruction of the spirit within. He wants to end the Avatar line because the title and power of it represents balance, and if Korra is the last Avatar, then nobody would be able to undo the link between worlds and restore balance as it were before. So what does he do? He not only tortures Korra to force her into the Avatar state, seeps liquid metal into her body to essentially stop her bending completely and paralyze her, but causes her to be beaten in the state to such a degree that she is basically only able to escape with the skin of her teeth with help from the other members of Team Avatar. Oh, but that's not before he tries to suffocate her by literally taking the breath from her lungs and suffocating her brain flow with it in a vacuum. With this not only being the second time he does it, but has known to be lethal as he killed the Earth Queen with it. Granted, she deserved that one. Zaheer wins in a way as well with this, because of Korra being wheelchair bound for a good year or so until she goes through an excruciating process to have the metal poison taken out of her and left with literal PTSD over this incident that haunts her in Book 4's entirety, and basically leaves the Avatar out of commission for three years. So while he certainly didn't gain the ultimate victory of ending the Avatar line, period, with Korra, it's certainly clear that if Korra did have the backup she did by that point, she would have been the last Avatar, or probably would have been worse off in Book 4. Which, speaking of Book 4... Kuvira is honestly the best villain in the show, because she may as well be the most believable of them in the long term. Her entire villain arc came about as a response to the actions of Zaheer took in Book 3, and overall is a direct response to his actions on the Earth Kingdom as a result. It's also a small, slow build villain arc as well, and she was a minor character in Book 3 who was more or less directly impacted by the inaction that Su Yin Bei Fong took as part of the Earth Kingdom's lineage, and more or less Korra not being around to try and help put the pieces back together. Her motivations, however justified may be, do not in fact justify her next steps, and she goes from a relatively well-adjusted person to literal fascist in the span of three years, as by the time we see her again in Book 4, she's an absolute far cry from the person we've seen up until now. She's having people call her the Great Uniter, threatening people with harm if they do not agree to her terms, and once she takes over a section of the Earth Nation, outright demands people acknowledge her Roman reign style will be thrown in prison. Where have we seen this before? Look, I'm not about to call Kuvira the Avatar equivalent to this guy, but let's just say she's not exactly making a good defense case for herself. That being said, however, she's arguably the best villain in TLOK in spite of those comparisons. Kuvira not only takes the entire Earth Kingdom, beats down Korra in a process in such a way that, like Sahir, if she did have the backup, she'd be squashed. Great, granted, this is still PTSD, Korra, but still. Manages to make herself such a credible threat to, to Republic City that is literally needed to be evacuated because of her literal mecha attacking the city, and she only stops her rampage upon realizing she could have been killed in the process. But she still manages to do the most damage to the Earth Nation, disrupt the Earth Kingdom monarchy to such a way that it's basically dissolved when the crisis is ended, and even though it's not how she intended, changes the world in such a way that it would never be the same after her. Kuvira won on every single ground except for taking back the bits of the Earth Nation that were on Republic City. But if she hadn't gone to that level and basically waged war with the rest of them, there's no telling that she what would have happened if she was left to be. To be honest, the way Kavira was by the end of it, if she hadn't been stopped by Team Avatar, I feel like she could have been the Earth Nation's version of Ozai. I know that comparison will piss a lot of TLOKers and ATLA purists off, but if you look deep within your very soul, you'll know it to be the truth. TLOK's villains, even if some of them are in the most flawed parts of it, make the series so much bigger because all of them seek to do their own change, but the change they all seek isn't one of positivity for the world around them. It's their twisted ideals of no longer needing bending, no longer needing the Avatar, and no longer needing other nations that make their sense of change that much more deranged. And honestly, with motives that extend more than just kill Korra because she's the Avatar, 
I feel like in some ways that might be better villains even than the ones at ATLA. Again, I feel like ATLA purists will bomb the comment section for that little mention, but that's just like everything else in this video. My view on this. While I do see a lot of people praising the episodes that show off the first Avatar and the origins of Rava and Vatu, I see a lot of equal disdain for how the fandom sees the origins of Bending and the Avatar cycle in general, and that the story as well as the entire explanation of the two's existence removes the mystique of the Avatar and ruins what came before. Which, let's be clear here, isn't really a thing that happened as much as it was primarily just a way for the writers to actually give a proper explanation of what the Avatar was, and finally give some proper world building behind it. Because, being blunt about this here, while we were given hints about the history of what the Avatar was, you could basically summarize what an Avatar was in ATLA in the same way you could answer the question, what what's a hunter, hunter in Hunter Hunter? And when people got the explanation of the Avatar is literally powered by an all-powerful spirit that represents the world's good and is meant to keep the representation of the world's chaos and evil at bay, sadly people were like, let's just go back to being a cool guy. Like, I could sit here and explain to all those that aren't fan of this how Taoism and the yin and yang aspect and whatnot fits into this whole thing, but I feel like I'd either really butcher it really badly or not really be explaining how it works that great. So my defense is this. Spirituality has already been tied to the Avatar lineage, so why is Rava, a literal spirit, being the source of the Avatar's power such a bad thing that needs to be contested so much? The only thing I will say though in agreement with these points is that I get the issues of pertaining to the Dark Avatar and Vatu's whole thing of being the essence of pure evil in the world, given the fact that by this point they're able to give so much more of a different nuance to it all as to how morality works, and having it end up being so black and white we've literally shown grey morality successfully, is quite the annoyance, I won't lie. Admittedly, this topic was one that almost flew under the radar for me, but a lot of people's issues with it as well seem to be with how they treat the legacy characters from ATLA in this show. And putting it very bluntly here, while I understand where some people's arguments are coming from with this, especially with the aforementioned Bayfong family being feds this year, there's a lot more to unpack here than you may think. First off, let's talk about Aang. Given the fact that by a lot of people's opinions on the matter, he's gone from being the goofball hero at ATLA to basically be regarded as the Avatar universe's equivalent of Goku. But the truth about that comparison is that, in reality, it's not that far from the truth. It's just not in the way that you think it's being compared to. See, Aang is like Goku in the, in the way that he never really got that kind of father figure or proper experience with a mother and father like literally everyone else around him did, and, as a result, doesn't necessarily know what to expect with that kind of thing, especially with the whole being the Avatar as his literal job in life. Combine that with finding out that the only other airbender is one of his children out of the three, one of which gained waterbending and the other... Well, with no bending, and yes, of course you would think of him as wanting to favor Tenzin in the end, given that it would literally be like at the Sage and Dag speak a lottery instead of just automatically being there when your offspring is born. Aang is shown in the series to have gone through hell in a handbasket dealing with the likes of Yukon, and especially with the construction of Republic City before the time of the series occurs. Which I don't know about y'all, but that seems like a pretty big thing about needing to devote your entire life towards, especially when you're literally the living savior of the world or something. And that in turn leads us to the other, albeit smaller, issues in relation to this, that being the case saying that Zuko and Katara just show up in the series and don't really do much. And to that I say, well you're not exactly incorrect. It's wrong to say that they didn't do much of anything. Katara is literally prominent from the first 10 minutes of the series where we see her as one of the only people really rooting for Korra's abilities to stand out on her own, as she should given her whole arc throughout ATLA literally starting off from that same groundwork as what Korra is going through, so if there's anyone who would be rooting for her, it would be Katara. Not only that, but while her appearances are very sporadic through the series run, she's basically seen at some of the most pivotal moments for Tenzin's family and Korra as well, especially during the recuperation process Korra goes through following Zaheer. Which, while she admits she could only do so much, the fact that she got that far with Korra shows that she's still got it in her after so long in my opinion. 
And then there's Zuko, who more or less was pivotal in helping out the extended forces of TLOK's team Avatar in notifying of and taking down Zaheer. Say what you will about he was pretty much utilized in that season, but it can't be understated at how much him being around to help meant that much more in the end. But to be honest, while it is good to see them there, it's not necessarily their story anymore. Sure, it is nice that we do get to have them be able to impact the story of TLOK's cast in some ways, some more impactful than others, mind you. However, to say that they needed to have their own story in this is wrong, and potentially worse to say that their entire characters were ruined forever by what happens in TLOK, and gets revealed by characters in it, it's a realization that the characters we saw in ATLA weren't fully developed, not as characters, mind you, but as people in their own world. The five main characters had only really started maturing by the end of the series, and honestly, they probably had a laundry list of issues to try and resolve upon by the time the war with the Fire Nation ended by ATLA's end. Hell, even in the comics, it pretty much reflects that sentiment in very different ways, and I'd argue that trying to say what they were presented as in TLOK is wrong? is taking away the fact that even some of our heroes aren't perfect. They're just doing what they can with what they can work with, and it's also kind of seen with their kids as well, for better or for worse. Alrighty, here's the one I've probably been the most vocal about in the past when discussing this, the romantic relationship between Korra and Asami. Or rather, the lack thereof shown in the series itself. For context's sake, this is about four years before Steven Universe would have the first same-sex kiss in a cartoon and reunited between Ruby and Sapphire, and a similar domino effect of queer moments being shown across multiple networks and cartoons would be portrayed. But I'm gonna stick my neck out here and say that if it wasn't for Kurosami, we would have gotten any of those moments because as much as Rebecca Sugar fought for that moment to remain in the show, it's this relationship that makes me feel like it would have been significantly different without it. To put it bluntly, Korra and Asami's relationship is a complicated one for most of the show's run, going from tepid friends who are both crushing hard on Mako, to, having, to both having a relationship with him under very interesting circumstances, to just friends who are sort of awkward with each other due to the history of dating someone mutual, and finally, to more than just friends. And unfortunately, the show doesn't get to explore their relationship beyond that visually, with them walking into the spirit portal, holding each other's hands, and looking into each other's eyes at the end of this finale. But as Brian Conatesco would later post about on his Tumblr just days after the scene aired, he confirmed that they had pitched a more overt tone to it to Nickelodeon, but they were shot down due to not being able to get away, which was such a display at the time. However, you can definitely still see that they were, at least over the continued airing of the series, kind of an organic relationship, especially in late book 3 and a lot of book 4. I mean, you can't tell me that Asami's reaction to not being written to by Korra is anything a heterosexual woman would ever react to being told by her bestie, and Korra's initial stammering and unable to give a concrete response as well, albeit being equal parts due to her trauma, is something for consideration. Even before that, Asami being the one to offer herself up to take care of Korra when she's been poisoned by Sahir is a key indicator of this. Alongside Korra reading Asami's letters first out of everyone else's, like seeing multiple people with unread messages to look at, but viewing your crushes before any others. Not only that, but their body language around each other for most of Book 4, especially at two separate points, really gives off the impression that there's more under the surface that is shown. One being in the clip show in Book 4, Remembrance, where at the end, Korra ends up confiding in Asami somewhat over the events of what has happened to her since the beginning of her journey three years ago. She could have literally confided in anyone, even in Mako, despite their breakup in Book 2. But she chose Asami. And in the finale, during Varric and Zuli's wedding, when the two of them are just sitting with each other after it's all ended, Korra mentions leaving Republic City, and Asami initially offers herself up as a companion to join her. But I think we all know what she really meant by that. In a perfect world, we would have been able to see them seal the deal on the screen itself, but for what it's worth, I'm glad that they managed to finally show it off in all of its sapphic glory in the comments. Which you should totally pick up if you haven't already, they're amazing follow-ups. And this last one, I feel, is the core argument behind why so many people really don't like TLOK compared to ATLA, because it's not a direct continuation with the same themes and aesthetics that, as ATLA had, 
and I feel like that's a very backwards approach to it. Because let's be honest here, TLOK isn't the first series to be radically different than what came before, but still be a continuation of the beloved series regardless. You wanna know what other series did this exact same thing? Batman Beyond. And we all know how much love that gets for its radically different setting characters from the series that came before being older and less focused on, and having a more brash and less wiser teenage main character dealing with trauma every other season. So why is TLOK treated differently for basically following the exact same playbook that series like Batman Beyond did? Most likely because when it first came about, people were expecting more or less the same dynamic that ATLA had with its morals and world build. But see, that's the problem. People at large expected TLOK to be ATLA Part 2. But that's not what a good sequel is. If TLOK was just ATLA all over again, people would decry its unoriginality like they did with Star Wars and its sequel trilogy, but they went in the opposite direction, was meant to, which meant it was too different to what came before to the fans of ATLA. Essentially, to the public that mentions those issues, there's no real winning here as we've discovered in the last decade. So to those people, I say this. <clears throat> Stop comparing Korra to ATLA. Let it stand on its own merits. Yes, the setting of the Four Nations is drastically different from the setting that ATLA was in 100 years prior. That is what happens when society is allowed to thrive together in harmony and not be at war constantly. It's almost like what happened in actual history or something. Yes, the story is more serious and less lighthearted, and the same vibes that we had for the majority of the old series aren't there anymore. But that's also fine. It's what happens when you realize the audience that watched the show four years ago have grown up and have been able to indulge in more mature themes than media as a whole. And yes, it's not what the fans at the time or even now would have expected it to be as a follow-up to ATLA. But again, ATLA and TLOK are two separate entities entirely. End of the day, this is what happens when you allow a franchise to spread its wings a bit and be able to be seen as more than one show that's amazing and another that's just in its shadow. Legend of Korra on its own is a very good show that tells an amazing story and manages to be self-contained as well, given it's a part of a larger mythos for sure. But as a sequel to Last Airbender, it deserves way more recognition for what it does that is good compared to what it does that isn't seen as good as its predecessor. And I think it's about time that it deserves that recognition and then some. Some watching this may disagree, but The Legend of Korra deserves it if not for the fact that it's more than what the fan outrage at the time, and even now, makes it out to be. But rather, it deserves it for the fact that it's an amazing body of work, albeit with some cracks in there, but an amazing one nonetheless.